I'm going to make a confession right up front here and tell you that I receive a lot of cyberpunk games to consider for review and I reject just about every single one of them because I find them so derivative and devoid of anything new. The only times you will ever see me reviewing a cyberpunk game at this point is basically when it's not really cyberpunk. And that's what's happening here. New Edo is a tabletop RPG by Russ Rollins of Salty Games published in 2022 after a successful Kickstarter. Just like a lot of games that present themselves as neon samurai or anything like that, they just fly under the radar of most folks. But New Edo is really pretty radically different from your standard cyberpunk fare. I actually had a conversation with the author trying to describe the actual genre that this game fits into. The terms cyber fantasy, techno fantasy, neo utopian, cyber utopian, and neon folklore were bandied about, but mythotech might be the best fit. I'll unpack why that is exactly in this video, but first, let's take a look at what the physical book looks like. The book is wrapped in brown paper that appears hand stamped with a stylized New Edo logo. There's also this little plastic sword attached to some red ribbon. I guess this is a bookmark, which might be 3D printed, but it has a lot of flex to it, which is a good thing in terms of durability. The book itself feels pretty thick in the hand and somewhat hefty. The cover has a matte finish and the print colors are clean. The pages are stitch bound from what I can tell and the internal pages are also matte and somewhat thicker than average, which is what gives the book its girth. Overall, the print quality is really pretty good, a step above print on demand, but devoid of any extreme bells and whistles you see in some off print books. There are a lot of unique aspects to this game besides the refreshing take on cyberpunk, but let's start with that. In this fictional world, your character lives in a Japan-like nation referred to as the Empire in the middle of the 21st century. This is normally where I roll my eyes because I think a lot of cyberpunk is slaved to Japan and Japanese culture, but New Edo honestly surprised me. In this setting, mythical creatures and races exist sheerly because people believe they do, and gods large and small known as kami also exist and fuel your character's magical spells. There can be kami for anything, like the fundamental elements of matter all the way to things like fear and rope. As far as cyberspace, there is none. The technology is compared to that of Star Wars, where there are lots of robots doing menial jobs and other miraculous technology for weapons and body augmentations, but the internet is in its absolute infancy. There is also no corporate oppression. Corporations exist and they are at odds with each other, but they do not rule over the people, nor do they have plans to. Instead, there is an ancient imperial government that rules with a fair hand. In the timeline, by the way, this pseudo-Japanese empire never invaded another country or imposed their will on foreign lands. Instead, they remained isolated for centuries and ironically now start to face corporate imperialism from other countries on their soil. And finally, maybe one of the most striking and really challenging aspects of this setting is that in the megacity of New Edo, personal crime is rare. This ties closely to actual modern day Japan, but for an RPG styled almost like a cyberpunk game, the lack of personal violence can be a difficult roadblock to conflict resolution. There are heavy handed police everywhere who keep an eye on anyone who gets out of line. But really the most notable aspect of this setting is the fact that anything a group of people believes to be true becomes true. One example would be in the old town part of the city where there are a lot of ancient temples and structures. If a corporation bulldozes an old building to make way for a high rise, the next morning the old building will be there again untouched because the surrounding population wills it to be so. The beliefs can range from something like that to something even more far reaching like the existence of yokai, which are playable races that come in the form of traditional but anthropomorphized mythological creatures, all the way down to something as small as a family believing there is a monster living in their basement. This concept of subjective reality means that anything goes in the setting, and it's part of the reason why the author aptly terms the setting mythotech, among other things. The game uses a dice pool system that is somewhat complicated at first blush. For any check, you will roll d10s from a core trait and up to five dice that aren't d10s for a skill. In the example given in the book, the character Usu is trying to scare off some street scum, so she will use her intimidation skill 
which is associated with her presence core trait. That presence trait has three ranks, which means she will get 3D 10 there. And her intimidation skill has four ranks. This is where things get a little complicated. A skill can have up to five ranks, but depending on how much XP you have dumped into leveling up that skill, the die will be different. In Usu's case, her intimidation skill has 1d6, 1d6, 1d8, and 1d12 for its four levels, which of course means that those are the dice that are added to the pool. The idea is to roll your dice and then add everything up in order to meet or exceed a target number for the task. One really notable thing is that the D10s for your core traits explode. So anytime you roll a 10 on a D10, you add 10 to your final result and then roll that D10 again indefinitely, as long as you keep rolling 10s. One other notable mechanic is that you can boost your dice result by up to five by spending legend points. This is a meta currency that is fueled by role playing and gets refilled pretty frequently. So players are encouraged to fudge their rolls with these points. The legend system actually goes a bit deeper. When you create your character, you have to come up with a motivation or legend as the book terms it, something that drives them, which should be more than an everyday aspiration. You actually have a permanent legend score, and this is tied to whatever class or path that you choose. As you increase your permanent legend score through doing awesome things in the story, you eventually get to the next path rank. Path ranks can be thought of as your character's level. Temporary legend points, by the way, can also be used as last ditch hit points. Once you've exhausted all of your hit points and your temporary legend points, your character is truly dead. Probably the most innovative mechanic in the game is the fate card. This starts essentially as a blank D100 table. At the upper range from 96 to 100, there is a critical success. At the bottom from one to three, there is a botch. Anytime you're rolling a check, you can first opt to roll on this fate card, which is unique to your character. Critical successes and botches will obviously determine your role accordingly, but where things get interesting is the fact that when you start building and advancing your character, you get to put pre-written descriptions into the card anywhere you want on the range of one to 100. Some entries will be good and some entries will be bad for your character, but the only way to find out what you get is to roll it before a check. This whole concept is interesting in a couple ways. One, it adds a gambling element that I always think is fun. It's something that players can opt into if they're feeling lucky. And two, it's built from the ground up with each new character. So you'll never have the same fate card twice, no matter how many times you play this game. Character creation involves ranking different aspects of your character from A to E. You allocate one of five letters to each of these five aspects, and that letter determines how strong that aspect will be. You have to use this table to actually translate those letters into the numbers of various points you can allocate to different things. You get one of each letter for the five aspects of background, magic, augmentations, skills, and core traits. Two things to note here. If you put priority E into magic, you are locking your character out of using magic at all in the game. And the second thing is that the higher you prioritize core traits, the more of a jack of all trades your character will be because they will just succeed more generally at any given task, but not necessarily specialize, at least at first. I do find it fascinating that the core traits are sort of decoupled from other aspects of your character at creation here. You also have some derived traits that are calculated from your core traits. Here are the formula for getting those. Then you choose a path for your character, something that can be akin to a class. 17 of the paths in the game are associated with factions and four are unaligned with any faction. There is a remarkable amount of detail for each of these paths, so I'll just briefly go over a few here. As an example, the faction Eiko has three paths that you can choose from. The Eiko themselves are an alliance of clans who seek to preserve the traditions of the empire and wear traditional clothing like kimono and uniforms from a bygone era. Within the Eiko faction, you can choose the Boar clan path. Like all paths, there are five ranks, which can be unlocked by earning permanent legend points, as mentioned a minute ago. Here you can see the explanation of rank upgrades. They're all pretty meaty in description, and I can tell you right now that you're not going to have enough space on your character sheet to capture all of this as your character ranks up, but the details are a lot of fun. The second path within the Echo faction is the Earth Dragons, basically samurai holdouts who want things to be like the way they used to be. By the way, it's mentioned in the setting description earlier that most people in this city carry a wakizashi, or short samurai sword, mostly because it's fashionable. 
I feel like between that detail and the fact that you have these hardline militaristic samurai like the earth dragons walking around, among other factors, personal violence might actually be a bit more common in the city than one is led to believe. There's a faction called the Metro Response Directorate, and I have to mention this one because it can offer a completely different play experience than the last faction we looked at. The paths here are all law enforcement. The Hitokage path is the MRD's surveillance and infiltration arm with skill enhancements sort of in that vein. A player who chooses Inspector as their path obviously sets a game up for mystery and investigation. And responders are medics and support characters. Okay, lineages. So 90% of the 50 million people in the city of New Edo are human, but the other 10% or 5 million are made up of yokai, these mythical humanoids based squarely on Japanese myths. If you choose to play as a yokai, that choice will affect your character's physical appearance, but won't limit your path choice. The first of these is the Bakaneko, a cat-like lineage. As with all these lineages, there's a choice of two different cultures, both giving a stat or ability bonus of one sort or another. For the Bakaneko, it's either sly or charming. Humans can be either inspired or tenacious. Kappa, which are like a mix between turtles and frogs in a humanoid form, can have either the commanding or bellicose culture. Karasu, or crow, can be either tactical or strategic. Kitsune, or fox, can be either insightful or awakened. Oni, or demon, is either stalwart or imposing. Saru, or monkey, is either savage or analytical. Tanuki, or raccoon dog, is either lucky or bold. And Usagi, or rabbit, is either dauntless or determined. I wanna pause here and take note of Usagi because I can't help but think of Usagi Yojimbo, a character created by Stan Sakai in 1984 and who has appeared in over 200 issues of a comic book by the same name. The comic tells the story of a rabbit ronin who exists in a world of anthropomorphic animals in feudal Japan and who always does the honorable thing. Truth be told, I only discovered Usagi Yojimbo when he made a guest appearance in my favorite Saturday morning cartoon as a kid and only much later read the comics. But my point is that Usagi in this game are depicted as stoic, intensely honorable, duty-bound types. And I'm definitely feeling the connection here. Finally, there is Hisanaka, which are cyborgs more machine than human at this point. They don't have cultures to choose from, but they do get these modifiers and bonuses at the start. All magic in the game, at least as used by PCs, comes from kami, which is to say it's all divine magic in a sense. If you want to cast a spell, or rote as it's called in this game, your character will need to make some kind of utterance and do something with their body or hands. As far as the mechanics, you have to spend some temporary legend depending on the strength of the rote itself, and roll the number of d10s equal to your character's shimpi level plus a skill. There are four default rotes that anyone can learn here, and the rest of them are divided into tiers based on the kami they come from. Here are six of the eight tier one kami and the rotes that they are associated with. For example, the light kami has two rotes that you can use, glow and holograms. These each have a cost in legend points to cast, a skill associated with them, and things like range and duration. At the higher end of character advancement, there are tier five kami, specifically three of them, time, energy, and matter. If you decide to choose one of these for your character, you automatically get all of the rotes associated with it, but lock yourself out of one of the other two remaining spheres. Metaphysically, your character actually becomes an aspect of this kami that you choose, and you're also given a slew of extra superpowers as described here. There are 20 cybernetic augmentations listed in the book, and they each require a certain minimum of core trait scores for you to install them. If you have an excess of trait score points, you can install more powerful and effective versions of each of these augmentations. They range from one to five in level. So for example, this combat CPU requires that you have a power rating of two and a savvy rating of six to install at level one. But if you want a level five combat CPU, all those requirements are multiplied by five, so you would need a 10 in power and a rating of 30 in savvy. It's also worth noting that each time you install a new augmentation, you add a 1% chance to your fate card of biofeedback damage that comes in the form of 10 HP. If you've been paying attention to how the mechanics work in this game thus far, then combat is really pretty intuitive. 
core trait plus skill against a target's defense rating. But one cool feature that I really liked was the wounds system in this game. As your hit points erode in combat, there are granular steps at which your PC's performance degrades. You can see on this table how that works. The only drawback to this system is that you have to recalculate all these percentages each time your HP increases. But what's cool is that you get a more plausible approach to taking damage. There is a really pretty involved protocol for formal dueling that comes in the form of four stages, bravado, assessment, the first cut, and conclusion. I appreciate that these rules exist and that there is a formal approach to duels because it's very thematic, but I will say it would be really nice if the GM had these protocols memorized before a game session so that the table is not waiting around while the GM tries to learn all this. It's really pretty involved. Here's a list of the melee weapons and grenades in the game. Probably the most important aspect of these weapons is that they each in fact have their own damage die if you land a hit. Also, you're going to have to Google a lot of these Japanese terms to get an idea of what each of these weapons are, unless you are at the very least an amateur scholar of feudal and ancient Japanese warfare. This list of guns is a bit more universal. Again, I'm wondering why the setting of New Edo is described as being almost completely devoid of personal violence. From the look of this page, it looks like things are about to hit the fan. The rules for vehicles is fairly involved, with any given vehicle having a whopping 16 stats to define virtually all aspects of its performance and durability. I really like the Kaneda up here. Nice reference to Akira. There are actually 10 more vehicles listed at the end of the book, as well as some creature stat blocks, and a long list of generic NPCs like politicos, samurai, street cops, and some named NPCs with specific personalities and motivations. So all right, here are my thoughts on New Edo. Tough for beginners. Just one look at the character sheet and you can see that this might not be the most ideal game for newcomers to the hobby. One of its greatest strengths is that your character is customizable, but that means a player has to understand a lot of interlocking rules, and that can be tough for casual or new players. Challenging setting. I think one of the most frustrating things that this game could do is create the expectation of vanilla cyberpunk adventures on its cover, when in fact it's trying to exist in a more peaceful world that's filled with magic and mythology come alive. The refreshing take on futuristic cyber Japan feels authentic here. There are obviously some undeniable parallels to the cyberpunk genre, but the differences are what stand out. There are no oppressive megacorps plying their agenda on the populace. There is no rampant crime wave. There is no post-apocalyptic environment where the sea levels have risen, where the air is radioactive or anything like that. The lore itself is fun because it's vaguely reminiscent of Japan through the ages, but diverges early on and becomes quite its own thing. Between the history of New Edo, the mythical creatures, and the kami, it really does feel like there's an alt-Japan culture in play here. And that's actually a pretty difficult thing to pull off. Mechanics. I think despite the complexity of the game in terms of the different moving parts on the character sheet, the underlying dice roll mechanic remains relatively simple and approachable. Whether it's combat, casting magic, or doing whatever it is you're trying to do, it always comes down to one or more d10s from your core trait plus dice from a skill. The multiple uses of legend points is a nice touch where you can use them to cast spells, boost rolls, and act as emergency hit points. And in order to increase your permanent legend points, you have to play your character in accordance with their motivation. If you look a little closer at the rules, there's actually some clever balancing going on. For example, you can mix magic and technology without any narrative or mechanical drawbacks. You only need the right resources. There's also no penalty for using biotech, which is to say the game is not using the negative stereotype about cybernetics. Well, almost no penalty. You do pick up a 1% chance of occasionally suffering some biofeedback with augmentations, but that's only when you want to try your luck on your fate card. As far as balancing in combat, melee and ranged both have advantages in certain scenarios, so it's not entirely obvious which one is superior. Customizable characters. As you might have already seen in the video, characters are pretty deeply customizable. Creation starts with the prioritization of the five aspects, and then you spend points in each of those aspects. But then you have the fate card, which is this infinitely varying D100 table specific to your character. And the paths themselves offer a pretty good bridge between your character concept and the setting itself, layout and art. First of all, hats off to the creator and artists for not sexualizing 
It seems like a lot of RPG books in the cyberpunk related space are almost trying to cater to pubescent boys. Generally speaking, the layout is top notch as well. You'd be surprised to note that this book was laid out in Microsoft Word. So that's quite an impressive feat. More to come. There's actually an official expansion to this game called 77 Stories in New Edo, launching on Kickstarter in a few months. It will provide a bunch of plot hooks that revolve around the game's themes of magic and technology and include intrigue, politics, heists, and maybe a bit of personal violence. I appreciate the fact that this game is being supported in this sense. I think this Kickstarter will launch in October of 2023. So in the end, I think New Edo is one of these brilliant non-cyberpunk games that gets mistaken as cyberpunk. It's really a game about an almost dreamlike fantasy city where anything the population believes becomes true. There's so many places you can go with that concept alone. And the fact that there are mythical creatures already living in the city for centuries as normal citizens means that this world is already lived in and just waiting for you to come and blow it all up. That's all I got for now. I've left links to where you can find New Edo down below. Thanks for watching. See ya.